You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, God damn it! Get the point good. And now... Bend over. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Ah, hey there, hi there, ho there, everybody. Guess what? It is a wacka, 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 wacka doodle Wednesday here in Grammy land. And that means that my rocket chair is probably going to have some whacked stuff going on. Not necessarily fun, but it'll definitely be whacked. <laughs> of course, you know, pretty much any show with me is pretty well whacked. I enjoy being wacky, but yeah, that was Prince, and I'd I'd watched a, uh, now that YouTube is back up, my God, Twitter was going absolutely nuts. I mean, I'm starting to see stuff in my Twitter feed about about how uh, YouTube was down forever, and really? Okay, so do something else. <laughs> It's kind of the way I look at it. You know, if there ain't nothing on YouTube that's just kind of reaching out and grabbing me, I just don't watch it. And I tell you what, I go days, days without watching a single video. I know. Scary, ain't it? Oh, well. Oh, my. Rob Works is talking gobbledygook. I love gobbledygook. Well, unless it's a pile of gobbledygook, and then it probably reeks. But in any case, I'm going to start saying hey to everybody. Just because that's kind of sort of what I do. Oh, look, there's Rush Limbaugh over here on Twitter. Hey, Twitter, thank you, Barman, for tweeting me out. And Grimner, I know you're behind it. I know you are. Yeah, by the way, y'all are listening here on RealLibertyMedia.com channel 10 or on the RLM Spreaker channel. But if you are listening in on the Spreaker channel, just know I got crap internet. So if you want to chat with me or converse with me in any way, shape, or form, come on over to RealLibertyMedia.com. Think of a nickname. Join the chat. And uh, say hey, you know, and I'll say hey back or not. You never know. Depends on if I'm, you know, squirreling or not. But I got 480 stalkers. Woo woo. I still haven't broken that 500 mark. That's my goal. (laughs) And then when I hit that one, then I'll set another goal, like maybe 501 (laughs) or 502. God only knows. But yeah. Thank you, Barman, for tweeting me out. Really appreciate it. And uh, hey there to all of my new uh, followers slash stalkers. Appreciate it. Uh, YouTube down suffers global outage. Google-owned company apologizes. Ah, we're so sorry, Uncle Albert. Even if you're not an Uncle Albert, we're still very sorry. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. But, you know, not in the way that you mean. So... That's okay. Please do not do forced apologies. That's just lying. Don't don't force somebody to apologize. That's condoning lying. That's that's just a little Grammy tidbit there for you. Thank you, Grimmy, over here on reallibertymedia.org for sharing it out and letting everybody know that, hey, I'm on the irreverent and irrepressible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I also see Bob Renner is on here as well as Bobby Bain and Rob Works. And let's see, who else? Um Amelia McCord was on earlier and thank you dear lady Amelia. I truly do appreciate it. Uh, I also see Mary B was on not too long ago as well as Aunt. Hey Aunt, how's things? How's things? You know what? Do I have I know I had a problem with Freedoms Network the other day. It didn't wish to come up. So let's just try that again. And I know uh, somebody, what? Okay, now it's telling me to refresh and it's not coming up. Well, I guess I won't. Oh, let's, let's try this. We'll just back that off. Nope, it still tells me sorry. 
Okay. Well, I guess I won't go to that effing site, see what's going on over there. On Fakey Book, got all kinds of going on. And uh, yeah. Oh, Bretta Joey, you big wussy woo. <laughs> I just posted on Facebook just before I went on to let everybody know that. Did you know that a one-gallon bag of shredded zucchini will make five dozen zucchini muffins? It does. And Brother Joey said, um, that'll ruin that many muffins. <laughs> He's such a wussy woo. Shame on him. Okay, uh, other than that, I really don't see a whole hell of a lot going on over here on Facebook either, other than my brother David is just having a damn good time with Elizabeth Warren. Yeah, mm-hmm, there you go, you just go ahead and cry, Lizzie. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her fought. do anybody remember that one? Moving along, over here on Minds. What's going on over here on Minds? Did you know that an educated and informed people will be a free people? That's a JFK quote, by the way. All kinds of lovely images being shared over here today. I truly appreciate these guys doing this. Gives me wonderful brain food for, you know, when I'm not having such a wonderful day, then I can think back on some of these. Because, you know, once something is seen, it cannot be unseen. And once something is heard, it cannot be unheard. So... You know, it's kind of like those people that have started waking up and started seeing the truth, what's going on out there, and then they go, no, 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 I want to go back to being a sheeple. It was comfortable being a sheeple. Sorry, you just plain can't. That's that's the whole meaning of that. You can't go home. You know, you can never go home because home has changed. So, yeah. There you go. The golden rule. Treat other people like you would like to be treated with respect. Yes. Oh, that's a lovely one, too. Come on over to Minds.com. Check stuff out. Man, there's some really, really wonderful stuff over here. Brilliant, brilliant information and some absolutely amazing things to just, you know, eye candy, if nothing else. Or, you know, brain food, eye candy, wh however you want to look at that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just clicked on Twitter because I wanted to see what the update was. And I got to share this over in the chat. Which, by the way, today I am using Ice Chat. Um, just to see how I'm liking it. I still haven't really decided on which program I wish to use. Once I get one that I've figured out that I want to use, I'll stick with it. But until then... <sighs> Let's see. Okay, so Twitter, yeah... <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> I got a comment on that. Just because. It's too freaking funny. And James Woods is back on Twitter. Okay, now that I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and close Twitter because, yeah, it's too distracting. It's entirely too distracting. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah, I need to come on over here to the chat and say hey to everybody that's listening. Um, yeah, there you go, Art. <laughs> yep. Um, oh, you're the guy that... Uh, would be the traitor for the... Oh. Okay, Frumpy. Whatever. Over here on Real Liberty... Or in the RealLibertyMedia.com chat room. If y'all is over here, you need to come on over here if you ain't. I see Barman right up top. The most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. And then I also see Grimner, who is the RLM god. Don't you know? Um, do unto others... Yeah. See, in the circles told me, she said, um, it's it's kind of a negative way of looking at it, and yet it's positive. Don't do unto others what you don't want done unto you. You know, and that's pretty, yeah. What's that? Where's, what's a pretty good description of me? That I'm wackadoodle? <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, wait, what? Hmm, yee ha. I'm, I'm catching up on the chat and I changed the font too, and it's kind of fun. <laughs> okay. Art, you're still silly. You're so silly. I like silly. Um, okay. 
Moving along, saying, hey, good God, distraction. Can you say squirrel? I think you can. Hi, Moose Girl. The Mighty Moose is in the chat. Hey, Moosey, as well as the lovely Kate. How are you doing, dear lady? And thank you for wishing me um, pleasant dreams last night. I actually did have some pleasant dreams last night. Uh, let's see. I also see Anti is in the chat, as well as Art Underground. And looky there, got a double dip and a Chloe going on, as well as Cyborg Noodle. May you be touched by his noodly cyborginess. I also see D underscore C, as well as Echelon. Yours truly is here. I be Don C, Layer 8, and look at that, a double dose of pox. Double pock in the box. Got poxified and poxophone. We also got some pompo pompo pon sauce as well as the lovely rain and RLM fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. We also have roams and skittles and the bubbler dude, the one, the only, the Rob Works. Thank you ever so much, Rob Works, for firing up that bubbler. I sure do need that. And you know what? It shows in pink on my screen. That's freaking awesome. I also see Phantom is here as well as Asmo 2. And looky there, Colfax 101. I know that's the alter ego of someone. <laughs> and looky there, Dakota. You know, I actually looked at the radar earlier today and it didn't look like Dakota was getting too much going on. So that's a good thing. Because, yeah, y'all will be covered in that white stuff soon enough. I also see Frumpy is here. Hey, Frumpy, how you doing? I hear you have some spare Cialis. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you have a girly? You should be using that shit up. I also see Gromit is here as well as Java 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 Doctor 2 is in the house. And looky there, JJ's na 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 JJ's our Scottish feller, the the kilt wearing man. Hi. Looky there, Kozu is also here as well as Sock Puppet. Hey Sock. How you doing down there? How's things after the hurricane come through? Hope you didn't get hammered too awful bad. And Selenquist. Is that how you say that? Selenquist. I know. Pink bubbles. It's almost like Mr. Bubble. Have a bubbly bath and some bubbly fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's wacky doodle. Wacky doodle time. I'm a wacky doodle Grammy. Wacky doodle all the time. Okay, speaking of wacky doodle. <laughs> let's get into some fun stuff right off the bat, okay? Just because I saw this earlier today and I thought, oh, damn, that's just freaking awesome. And then I went, oh, no, demon weed, devil's lettuce. According to the telegraph.co.uk, Canada is to pardon convictions for cannabis as country becomes second in the world to legalize the drug. It's not a fucking drug. It's a plant. It's a plant. Seriously. God, the creator, whatever you wish, the source, what, however you wish to refer to it, that intelligence that, that made all this, even if it's just a, a um, virtual reality kind of thing, it's pretty freaking real. I pinch myself, it hurts. But it created all of this stuff. Why do you, I mean, it made aardvarks for God's sake. And platypuses. And seriously, ostriches and emus? I mean, there's some funky ass looking birds. So why not make mechahuana or cannabis? I mean, there's there's all kinds of there's like nightshade and all kinds of other plants that are actually quite deadly to not just humans, and yet this is the one that everybody says, but it's a drug. No, it's a plant, but it's a drug. No, it's a plant. You can say it's a drug all you want. But the only reason you're doing that is because Big Pharma can't patent it. Unless it's synthetic. And then you don't want that shit. Because God knows what they've put in it. Like formaldehyde. Or, ugh. I, it, it gives me the shivers just to think about it. 
In any case, according to this article, the Canadian government is ready to parole those with a pot possession record of 30 grams or less as Canada became the second and largest country with a legal national marijuana marketplace on Wednesday. Now, it is legal, which means, you know, they can collect tax money when you sell it. Yeah, now we know. Follow the money. A senior government official said that those with a record will be allowed to apply for pardon. Oh, you have to apply for it. Thanks. And the official was not authorized to speak publicly ahead of Wednesday's announcement and spoke on condition of anonymity. Hmm. Now, on Wednesday, Canada became Canada. Kanakistan became the second country after Uruguay to legalize so-called recreational marijuana so-called seriously Tom Clark who's 43 um, his shop opened at midnight in Newfoundland Canada's easternmost province I'm living my dream teenager Tom Clark is loving what I'm doing with my life right now he said well I am just so happy for you Tom I really am. And you know what? They're going to see a really big rise in sales until the newness wears off. And then it's going to slack, slack off a bit. And then it's going to level off. Because that's just the way that shit works. Now, Clark has been dealing marijuana illegally in Canada for 30 years. He wrote in his high school yearbook that his dream was to open a cafe in Amsterdam, the Dutch city, where people have legally smoked weed in coffee shops since the 1970s. Now, at least 111, three, uh, 111, an angelic number, uh, there's at least 111 legal pot shops that are planning to open across the nation of 37 million people on the first day. That's according to the Associated Press survey of the provinces. And that's a small slice of what ultimately will be a much larger marketplace. Now, no stores will open in Ontario, which includes Toronto. That's the most populous province, and it's working on its regulations and doesn't expect stores until next spring. Why? Because we must regulate this plant even though it will grow just about anywhere. We've got to step in and regulate it. Now, Canadians everywhere will be able to order Mechihuana products through websites run by provinces or private retailers and have it delivered to their home by mail. Ha! <laughs> Sweet! Longtime pot fan Ryan Bowes, who is 48 and a Lyft driver in Toronto, said it's about time. Well, yeah, it's about time. It's about space. <clears throat> okay. Alcohol took my uh, grandfather and it took my youngest son. And weed has taken no one from me ever. Huh. Yeah, more people die from aspirin. Because... <laughs> Seriously, if you really, really look past the bullshit, weed is not responsible for any deaths. Oh, sure, they say it is, but yeah. How many other cocktails did they have in their system? Oh, but we found cannabis. We found cannabis. That must have been what? It was the tipping point. It killed him. Sure, it did. If it comforts you to think that way, that's kind of like that hockey stick climate change bullshit. Really? Ah, oh, let's worship at the altar of scientism. Ism. Now, Canada has had legal medical marijuana since 2001. And amid excitement over the arrival of legal recreational pot, many in the industry spent the last days of prohibition on tasks familiar to any retail business, completing displays, holding mock openings, and training employees to use sales tracking software. Uh-huh. Track them, people. 
Now, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection invited Canadian media to a conference call on Tuesday so officials could reiterate that marijuana remains illegal under U.S. federal law and that those who are caught at the border with pot are subject to arrest and prosecution. I say... Stand on the border, all you Kanucky stands. Stand on that border. Light a joint. Fire up that hookah. Fire up the bubbler. Fire up whatever you got. Spark it, baby. And then blow. (laughs) That would be funny. Now, apparently, a patchwork of regulations has spread in Canada as each province takes its own approach within the framework set out by the federal government. Some are operating government-run stores, and some are allowing private retailers, and some are both. Now, Alberta and Quebec have set the minimum age for purchase at 18, while others have made it 19. And yet, you got to be 21 here in the United States to even have a freaking beer. But you can go to war, you can shoot somebody else for your government, but you can't have a beer. Oh my God. Yeah, <clears throat> we're not legalizing cannabis because we think it's good for our health. We're doing it because we know it's not good for our children. That's according to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. We know we need to do a better job to protect our children and to eliminate or massively reduce the profits that go to organized crime. What do you call government? (laughs) You're just shifting it from one organized crime family to another. Be honest. Come on, Trudeau. Don't be so dorkular. Oh, wait, no, he doesn't even cut. He doesn't even come up to dorkular. Uh, Killer peanuts. Nope, nobody's died from smoking a joint. Okay. But, 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 Art Underground, it's the devil's lettuce. Let's make a salad. (laughs) Oh, Graham, I hadn't thought of it like that. Yeah, 30 grams and you're pardoned, but 30.001 or more and you're a hardened criminal. Ooh, in Kanucky stand. Hmm. And I think there's more than two as well. Um, Rob works, but... mm, Yeah. (sighs) This is according to the UK Telegraph. You know, them people over there in the UK, they're a little odd. A little odd. But, gut dang fly. I have a touch screen computer, and when a fly walks across the screen... (laughs) It does some amazing things. It's amazing. Not necessarily cool, but I'm amazed. Which isn't really all that difficult to do. Okay, puff, puff, pass. And blow south. There you go. You know, people are going to start looking at those northerly winds and going, Come on, north wind. Come on, bring it, bring it. Or maybe not. But it does sound fun. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, let's see. Do I want to go there? No, 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 no. I have all kinds of fun things that I have pulled up and checked out. And, and... I'm not sure which one I want to go to next. Do I want to go there? Nah, I'm I'm enjoying the I'm enjoying the silliness part first. So let's see. Here we go. This is from Reason.com from September of this year. New research confirms we got cholesterol all wrong. Hey, hey. Am I shocked? No, I am not. 
Now, there's a comprehensive new study on cholesterol, and based on results from more than a million patients, it could help up in decades of government advice about diet, nutrition, health, prevention, and medication. Just don't hold your breath. No, 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 no. Okay. The study published in the Expert Review of Clinical Pharmacology centers on statins. It's a class of drug used to lower levels of LDL-C, or so-called bad cholesterol, in the human body. Now, according to the study, statins are pointless for most people. And every time my doctor tried to tell me, but your, you know, your cholesterol levels are a little high, and I said, yeah, and they keep changing the, what is the recommended level. Every year it goes down a little bit. My cholesterol levels have stayed pretty much stagnant. Doesn't make darn bit of difference what kind of dietary changes I made, what kind of exercise I changed. All my cholesterol levels stayed pretty much the same. It's your guys' little charts that keep changing. And every time she would tell me, but you need to take a statin drug, and I would tell her, you need to do some research on statin drugs and quit trying to poison me. Oh, but we'd much rather have you not have to worry about having a heart attack. And I said, oh, yeah, let's try and guilt me. Fuck you. I have no guilt. I have a mother and she's very good at it. I don't need you to guilt me. My mother guilted me enough when I was a kid and she laughed. In any case, back to this article. I know, squirrel. So, no evidence exists to prove that having high levels of bad cholesterol causes heart disease. And leading physicians have, or this is according to what leading physicians have claimed. Now, the Express, that was in the Daily Mail. The Express likewise says that the new study finds no evidence that high levels of quote-unquote bad cholesterol causes heart disease. You know, I actually had this explained to me one time by someone who actually knows something about you know, medicine and internal workings and all that fun stuff. And they said, what you people don't realize is that red blood cells are, you know, they're disc shaped. And so as they get pumping through the veins and the capillaries and the arteries and, you know, going down the uh, pathways throughout the body, sometimes they hit the walls of, you know, it's kind of like bumper cars they hit the walls and they do little divots and dings and all that other fun stuff and the cholesterol comes along and smooths it over again so it's smooth sailing again that's how it was explained to me and I went well holy shit hadn't thought of that that's just pretty cool so now the study also reports that heart attack patients were shown to have lower than normal cholesterol levels of LDL-C which is the bad cholesterol and that older people with higher levels of bad cholesterol tend to live longer than those with lower levels. And this is probably news to many in government, but it's not news to everyone. In fact, researchers have known for decades from nutrition studies that LDL-C is not strongly correlated with cardiac risk. That's according to Nina Titchell's. Ah, someone texted me. And in, she's an investigative journalist and author of the New York Times bestseller, The Big Fat Surprise. Along with a great recent Wall Street Journal op-ed highlighting ongoing flaws in federal dietary advice, which there's lots of them. Now, in an email to this author... Um, she pointed out that physicians continue focusing on LDL in part because they have drugs to lower it. Doctors are given are driven by incentives to prescribe pills for nutrition-related diseases rather than better nutrition, which is a far healthier and more natural approach. Well, you know, when they get kickbacks from big pharma and get to go to all these wonderful conferences and, you know, far off exotic places or at least have a really nice dinner. Yeah. Gets them in the pocketbook every time. 
Apparently, cholesterol in our diet comes from animals and animal products, including eggs, meat, fish, and dairy. And the government told us for decades that these foods were, to varying degrees, dangerous. Now, the Federal Dietary Policy is shaped by the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, or DGAC. <laughs> DGAC which meets every five years to update its findings. Now, the government touts that DGAC and the dietary guidelines it develops as an important resource to help our nation reach its highest, highest standard of health. And yet, people are sicker now per capita than they were 50 years ago. Figure that one out. Now, the federal government's war on cholesterol, as early as DGAC recommendations suggest, dates back decades. For example, in 1995, DGAC reports stressed the dangers of dietary cholesterol. Now, most people are aware that high levels of saturated fat and cholesterol in the diet are linked to increased blood cholesterol levels and a greater risk of heart disease, it declares. Choosing foods with less cholesterol and saturated fat will help lower your blood cholesterol levels. But only in 2015 did federal uh, dietary guidelines mostly halt the assault on cholesterol. Many hailed the news while still stressing that high cholesterol levels in our bloodstream is still a danger. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger, danger. Pay no attention to the fact that your brain is 60 plus percent cholesterol. Fat. Fat. That's what it is. Your brain needs cholesterol. Your liver needs cholesterol. If you don't take enough in, the liver has to produce more. <sighs> Back to the article. There's a growing consensus among nutrition scientists that cholesterol in food has little effect on the amount of cholesterol in the bloodstream. That's according to Harvard Medical School blog post. And it noted that same year that, and that's the cholesterol that matters. Oh, apparently the government's new stance on dietary cholesterol is in line with that of other nations which do not single out cholesterol as an issue. That's according to the Washington Post. And that was following the release of the most recent dietary guidelines in 2016. Yet it should not be confused with con officials' continued warning about high levels of bad cholesterol in the blood. There's a bad guy in your body. It's called cholesterol. Yeah, it's something that has been clearly linked to heart disease. That's, that's from those that practice medicine. Basically, get paid from Big Pharma. But according to the most recent study, it's throwing cold water on many of these continued government warnings about blood cholesterol. What's more, if bad cholesterol isn't so bad, then the benefits of so-called good cholesterol are also under assault. Recently, HDL, the so-called good cholesterol, or as my doctor told me, happy cholesterol, was itself deemed suspect in some cases. Dietary fat also appears not to be the danger the government says it is. And another new study reported on by or reported on by Ron Bailey this week suggests as he writes that the federal government's warnings to avoid dairy products that are high in fat is bunk bubkus so much gobbledygook that's a fun word isn't it Rob I like that word gobbledygook now <clears throat> I agree I am not a nutritionist I don't know the science on cholesterol is or if it is settled, but the federal government has warned us for decades about cholesterol in our bodies and in our food, which to me, going off article, to me, that's a big bell ringer in and of itself. Because anytime the government tells you that's bad, don't look, I'm gonna look 
and I'm going to check it out. Why? Because everything with the government is opposite day. Everything. Back to the article. But the federal government has warned us for decades about cholesterol in our bodies and in our food. And the fact that those warnings are now changing means the government has, despite what I'm sure are the good intentions of everyone involved, <laughs> been handing out poor dietary advice and developing regulations that reflect that his poor advice. Now, I'm one of the many who has called out the DGAC and the federal government for foisting decades of confusing and often contradictory dietary advice upon the American public. I also suggested in a column last year that one way the government might back up its claims to possess invaluable and unparalleled expertise in the area of food policy and nutrition would be stop regularly reversing or altering its recommendations. Yeah, in other words, don't make a, make a recommendation until you got the facts, darling. Not that stuff that's creatively put together, you know, with those very leading questions. Actual facts data, irrefutable stuff, you know, truth. Oh, wait, no, <laughs> truth and government. <laughs> I made it funny. Now, the reason that we don't know about these huge reversals in dietary advice is that the nutrition establishment is apparently loath to make the public their major, um, to make the public their major reversals in policy. How about to make the public aware of their major reversals in policy? Now, the low-fat diet is another example. Neither the AHA, aha, or the dietary guidelines recommended a low-fat diet anymore. But they have yet to announce this to the American public. And some in the establishment are still fighting to retain the low-fat status quo. Why? Because they got all of their money sunk in low-fat. You know what? I see something that's labeled as low-fat or, or no-fat. I steer clear. That's like a great big red light flashing. I go, whoa, bad juju. Walk away. That means no flavor no nutritional value. <laughs> I walk away from anything that says low in fat. So, <clears throat> I'm not your doctor, nor your nutritionist. And I have no idea what you should eat. And maybe the government should adopt that mantra too. Yes, maybe it should. I think I think there's no real maybes about it. But thank you, Reason Magazine, for that one. I think the government just needs to get out of our lives. Period. Do what? Washington Post is promoting Trumples as the most honest POTUS ever. Is that like a reverse psychology kind of thing? Okay. Oh. Oh no, Ra uh, Art Underground. I gotta, I gotta disagree with you. M maybe mm, depends on what you mean by eventually get it right. Yeah, that kind of that. Yeah. Because who are they getting it right for themselves? Or for everyone involved. I'm thinking, sure, they'll eventually get it right for themselves. Because, hey, you know, if they're still collecting a paycheck, then that's getting it right for them. But, you know, if we're still kicking the bucket because we're paying attention to what they have to say. Or we're still going to jail because we're relying on them. <laughs> that's not what I call getting it right. So... Yeah. Oh, look, we got some new people over here on realliberty.org. How awesome is that? Neener, neener, neener. 
Okay, I've been doing research on cholesterol ever since they've been trying to push cholesterol drugs on me. So yeah, neener, neener, neener. Hi, Bo Diddy and Mary B. I see you guys over here on realliberty.org. How awesome. Okay, I'm going to go back to my pocket because I just remembered something else that the government's sticking its fingers into and they need to just freaking stop it. Get your fingers out of there. They don't belong. That's just gross. So, this is from fee.org or the Foundation for Economic Education. And it was posted earlier this month. Compulsory schooling laws. What if we didn't have them? You know, eliminating compulsory schooling laws would break the century and a half stranglehold of schooling on education. And I'm thinking that's not a bad thing. So, and it was written by Carrie McDonald. Thank you, Miss Carrie. So, we should always be leery of laws passed for our own good. As if the state knows better. <laughs> yeah. Now, the history of compulsory schooling statutes is rife with partisanalism. Partisanalism. Wow, is that really a word? It is now. It's triggered by anti-immigrant sentiments in the mid-19th century and fueled by a desire to shape people into a standard mold. I'm sorry, but you're kind of a square peg. And all we have over here is round holes. So we're just going to shave off those corners, don't you know? Think you know. History books detailing the common school movement and the push for universal compulsory schooling perpetuate the myths that Americans were illiterate prior to mass schooling and that there were limited education options available and that mandating school attendance under the legal threat of force <coughs> was the surest way toward equality. Oh, here we go, throwing that equality shit around again. Have you ever seen the 8th grade graduation tests they had back in the 1800s? Seriously, I could not pass one. I could not. I would be doing good to get... A high F. <laughs> I've read those things. And yeah, I would get a high F. Or on a really good day, if they let me cram for it, I might get a really low D. But yeah, that's probably about the best I would do. Yeah. Them some bitches was tough. Now, back to this. In truth... Literacy rates were quite high, particularly in Massachusetts, where the first compulsory school statute was passed in 1852. And historians Bowles and Gintis reported that approximately three-quarters of the total U.S. population, including slaves, was literate. Now, there was a panoply of education pro, uh, options prior to mass compulsory schooling, including an array of public and private schooling options, charity schools for the poor, robust apprenticeship models, and homeschooling. Excuse me. And the latter approach being the preferred method of Massachusetts education reformer Horace Mann, who homeschooled his own three children while mandating common school attendance for others. Once again, we have an example of do as I say, not as I do, because I know what's best for you. How special is that? Now, the primary catalyst for compulsory school was a wave of massive immigration in the early to mid-1800s that made lawmakers fearful. We're feared. It's a national security issue. I need my security banky. And many of these immigrants were Irish Catholics escaping the deadly potato famine. And they threatened the predominantly Anglo-Saxon Protestant social order of the time. 
Aha! Now we get down to what's going on here. We have this of making you comply. Apparently, in 1851, the editor of the Massachusetts teacher, William Swan, wrote, <clears throat> In too many instances, the parents are unfit guardians of their own children. If left to their direction, the young will be brought up in idle, dissolute, vagrant habits, which will make them worse members of society than their parents are. Instead of filling our public schools, they will find their way into our prisons, which is probably why school, public school has become the precursor to prison and the job market. Because if all those little chattel going through the public education system, if they don't follow the gates and walk through all those burning hoops and burning doorways just properly, you either go into the workforce or the prison force. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, those houses of correction and almshouses, ooh, not much different from public education these days. Now, nothing can operate eff um, effectually here but strident legislation thoroughly carried out by efficient police. Ah, see, this is about when they quit being peacekeepers and started being law enforcers. Policing the area. The children must be gathered up and forced into school, and those who resist or impede this plan, whether parents or priests, must be held accountable and punished. Dun, dun, dun. Hmm. This is the true history of compulsory schooling that rarely emerges behind the veil of social magnanimity. Is that how you say that? Magnanimity. Oh, you're so magnanimous. Now, there was a power shift. First, power would tilt away from the state and toward the family. Without legal force compelling school attendance, parents would have the freedom and flexibility to assume full responsibility for their ch child's education. And they would not need government permission to homeschool, as is currently required in the majority of U.S. states. Private schools would not need to submit their attendance records to the state to show compliance. We must knock them edges off those square pegs. And public schools could still be available to those who wanted them, as they were prior to the 1852 law. But government schooling would no longer be the default education option. Default is usually the lowest level, the most base standard and yet, that's the law of the land? Wow. No wonder there's the overachiever thing kind of got... Yeah. Second thing that would happen, more choices. Because the state would no longer need to bless the creation of various private schools and ratify their curriculum and attendance protocols, an assortment of education options would emerge. Entrepreneurial educators would seize the opportunity to create new and varied products and services, and parents would be the ones responsible for determining quality and effectiveness, not the state. Wait a minute. Parents would have to be responsible for their youngins again? Egad and gadzooks. Of course, you know, with less government red tape, current trends in education would gain more momentum. Virtual schooling, part-time school options, hybrid homeschooling models, and an array of public schools with diverse education approaches would emerge. As more education choices sprouted, competition would lower prices, making access to these new choices more widespread. Ah, number three, you would have more pathways to adulthood. Well, you know, everybody's got a pathway to adulthood, chronologically. We'll just leave it at that. 
Now, without the state mandating school attendance for most of childhood, in some states up to 18 years, yeah, you're going to get 18 years in a educational facility. It's not that different from a correctional facility, is it? Not really. So, there would be new pathways to adulthood that wouldn't rely so heavily on state-issued high school diplomas. Innovative apprenticeship models would be created. Community colleges would cater more toward independent teenage learners. And career preparation programs would expand. As the social reformer Paul Goodman wrote in his, new, in his book, New Reformation, our aim should be to multiply the paths of growing up instead of narrowing the one, to the one existing school path. And, you know, just as a side note, my uh, granddaughter of my young, well, daughter of my youngest child, she is a freshman in high school this year, and they're having to declare their preferred profession, freshman in high school, so that they can cater to that and mold her curriculum around that. A 14-year-old expected to, yeah, think about that for a minute. We're going to start training you at 14 real hard for becoming a really good cog in the machine. That's what I thought. Now, granted, she has been interested in medicine and all kinds of stuff like that, for as long as I've known her and yeah that's when my daughter first met her daddy so you know it's mm, five years she's always been interested in medical stuff and she's really getting into holistic but yeah she's an amazing kid amazing kid and she's done wonders for my daughter <laughs> Because she was my problem child. And so those two, yeah, they've done wonders for each other. But back to this article. Another benefit of getting rid of the public education stranglehold is a broader definition of education. In his biography of Horace Mann, historian Jonathan Mazzarelli explains how compulsory schooling uh, contracted a once expansive definition of education into a singular definition of schooling. Indeed, today, education is almost universally associated with schooling. That in enlarging, <clears throat> excuse me, the European concept of schooling, man might narrow the real parameters of education by closing it within the four walls of the public school classroom. Eliminating compulsory schooling laws would break the century and a half stranglehold of schooling on education. It would help to disentangle education from schooling and reveal many other ways to be educated, such as through non-coercive, self-directed education or unschooling, which I have spent the last 30, 40 years unschooling myself. Now, even the most adamant education reformers often stop short of advocating for abolishing compulsory schooling statutes, arguing that it wouldn't make much difference. <laughs> yeah, right, sure. But stripping the state of its power to define, control, and monitor something as beautifully broad as education would have a large and lasting impact on re-empowering families, incurring educational entrepreneurs, and creating more choice and opportunity for all learners. So, I am, I have been going to the School of Hard Knocks for as long as I can remember. Sometimes I do quite well and I get a little gold star. And sometimes I don't do so well and I get a massive bruise or some other kind of scar instead of star. <laughs> so, 
So, um, yes. Yes, Art Underground, government just needs to get out, period. If I ran the zoo, <laughs> if I ran the zoo, there would be no alphabet soup agencies. Pretty much. I think they all need to just go away. Because all they are is just bigger leeches. They're all feeding off of us. And quite frankly, I'm tired of it. So, maybe if we all became elf responsible, you know, we uh, wouldn't need so-called goobermint to control our behavior. You think? Maybe if we controlled our own behavior, <laughs> that would eliminate the need for government. Not that there's a need, but, you know. Okay. Okay, got that shared over here on realliberty.org. Yay, hiccup. Hiccup. By the way, just to, you know, make you guys nuts, I did make five dozen zucchini muffins. <laughs> and a dozen banana chocolate chip muffins. So, you know, just just rubbing that in a little bit. Because I can. So, uh, da, 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 da. checking out mines real quick. Now that I have done that, let's see, where do I want to go first? Do I want to go with the schooling there? Or do I want to go with that? <sighs> okay, I found another one that the headline grabbed me from Alan West, the old school patriot.com. And uh, I think I'll just have to go there. I saw it over on Twitter and it's like, oh, damn it, headline grab me again. Apparently there's a new assault on free speech. No, really? Or did they just change its stripes from spots? Or maybe they're doing spots and stripes. Let's see. Greetings, everyone from Carlsbad, California. More like California. I've had a full day between Sacramento and San Diego here in the so-called Golden State discussing policy issues with major conservative donors. Yes, there are major conservative donors to the cause in California. Now first, I just want to thank y'all for making my second book, Hold Texas, Hold the Nation, Victory or Death, number one on Amazon yesterday. Yay, I didn't know you wrote that book, but yay. Um, uh, and that's in its category. Only in America can a fellow like me, born and raised in the inner city of Atlanta, be able to achieve such a feat. Now, let's really show the progressive socialist left a thing or two and propel this literary project to the New York Times bestseller status. I don't know that I really want to go there, Alan West, but I might, I might read it on Kindle. I might never know. If it's offered through my Amazon Prime. So, it's been an interesting day out here in California where folks truly recognize the seriousness of the situation. They also understand that the greatest export from California is not wine, social media tech giants, or agricultural products. It, it, is, it is indeed the cancer of progressive socialism that is metastasizing all over our country, including economically thriving red states. That is what Hold Texas, Hold the Nation, Victory or Death is all about. The leftists are fleeing these failed blue states, yet bringing their failed ideology with them. You know, much like people that wish to cross into the United States throughout go or without going through the proper channels, 
whatever those proper channels may be, and saying, I want to come to America, to the land of opportunity, but I want to bring all of my customs, and you must allow me to to do that. So you're fleeing from a place that makes you feel bad and fear for your life, and you're bringing that feel bad, fear for your life culture here and demanding that everybody allow you to carry on. Mm. Something wrong with this picture. That's kind of, that just reinforces the whole buckaroo bonsai thing of no matter where you go, there you are. Because you brought all your shit with you. So, this goes on to say, I tend to believe that there should be a sign on the interstate and major U.S. highways leading into Texas that say, Welcome to Texas. Why are you coming here? Go away. (laughs) so it's time we start to push back on this insidious locust effect that's spreading progressive socialism from failed states such as California, Illinois, New York, and New Jersey as some examples this is not just a phenomenon happening in Texas but it's being replicated in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee so I would like y'all like to provide y'all with a little anecdote evidence of which I speak. And uh, here it is. Texas Women's University, a public university located in Denton, Texas, denotes certain areas of its campus where students are permitted to exercise their constitutional First Amendment rights. The school has no plans to eliminate these areas, even as other schools and states have liberalized their campus speech regulations. Liberalized, a.k.a. meaning clamped down because if someone gets an emotional boo-boo, you've got to shut up. Now, on the school's main campus in Denton, there are several designated free speech areas where students can exercise their right to expression of personal politics, philosophy, religious views, surveys, or announcements. That's according to the school's website. And these zones include several grassy areas and a patio at the student union. But nowhere else are you allowed to express an opinion that might cause someone to have a massive butt hurt. To carry on with this, the school outlines its free speech zone policy in Article 1.16.A of its University Regulations and Procedures. Those who wish to engage in an, ex- in an expressive activity, including literature distribution, may engage in such expressive activity in the university's free speech area without prior registration or approval. Well, isn't that special? If you wish to express your opinion, you go to this little area over here. We're going to put you in this little box over here so that everybody walking by can go, leper, pariah, opinionist, egad. Now the policy lists five total areas on the Denton campus in which individuals may demonstrate any acts that are disruptive to the normal operations of the university, including classes and university business, or that invade the rights of others, will not be tolerated. Okay, so if someone's screaming in my face that, I don't like you, you said something mean, that's invading my rights, and it should not be tolerated. Oh, but wait, those are special little squeaky wheels. The rule defines a disruptive activity as obstruction, disruption, or interference with classes, research, administrative functions, or other university activities. And the school states that other areas on the school campus may also be utilized by departments or organizations for similar similar activities. However, Rever- uh, reservations are required. Uh, excuse me, sir. I have a reservation to come in here and express my opinion. Hmm. But those reservations are contingent upon the approval process. So, if your opinion doesn't fit with their approval process, sale chale, we have no tables. You're going to have to go elsewhere. 
Now, Denton, Texas is about 35 miles north of downtown Dallas, and it is the home of the University of North Texas. Now, as I ask, how can it be that when someone enters the campus of Texas Women's University, a public university that receives taxpayer funds, they lose their First Amendment rights? except for pre-designated spaces, zones, areas, where the individual right of freedom of expression and speech is allowed. I should have read that really, really fast, you know, like those infomercial people. But I'm sure you wouldn't have understood a damn thing. Now, am I the only one who realizes that this is not just absurd, but it's unconstitutional? Just who are these arbiters who make the determination? which is subjective as to what expressions do or do not violate the draconian, tyrannical, free speech zone policy of Texas Women's University. Uh, what part of Women's University did not go ding, 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 ding? Yeah, stupid me. I thought that colleges and universities were supposed to be places for free exchange of varying thought perspective and insights. I thought that these campuses were places where vigorous civil intellectual debate and discourse were to take place. Silly me. <laughs> She's so silly, Alan. Such a naive little bugger. Come here, let me give you a nookie. Get you in a headlock. Free speech is not disruptive activity. However, Blatant protests that obstruct, disrupt, or interfere with classes can be understood. And blatant protests and shout-downs of someone who is merely expressing an opinion, those are disruptive activities, especially when they start throwing threats around. That is a disruptive activity. So, <clears throat> This is no different from the progressive socialist belief that proliferated by their secular humanist cohorts, <coughs> excuse me, that we do not have freedom of religion. And you can practice whatever religion you want so long as you're not causing harm to another individual. Okay, yeah, I did put a stipulation on that. So, if you are among consenting adults, have at it. But if someone cannot consent, you cannot perform that religious act on them. Now, they advocate for freedom from religion. Fine. That's your religiosity. Fine. Oh, and while advancing the theory of freedom of worship. Yeah. The leftists prescribe the parameters of worship, such as telling Christian business owners that their faith does not extend to their privately owned businesses. Steve Green and Hobby Lobby had to fight the Obama administration's contraception mandate on such grounds. Which, <clears throat> you know, if you want to go bump uglies with somebody, I'm trying to be nice here. If you want to partake in the horizontal mambo, that's your business. If y'all are consenting, that's your business. Do not expect me to pay for anything that comes of it. If I was not a participant, I am not responsible. Now, my point is, this episode is occurring in Texas at a public institution called Texas Women's University. Not Wellesley. So if free speech has been redefined as acceptable speech that is not disruptive and must be regulated into predetermined zones, do we still have free speech? No. And free speech really isn't free. It costs you. Trust me. Sometimes just the mere expression of it can cost you. <laughs> so where did such a concept emanate? Well, <laughs> How utterly disconcerting that one has to seek a reservation in order to exercise their free speech right. No, I do not believe that students, faculty, or administration, or even visitors to Texas University or Women's University should be able to conduct demonstrations and protests that are intended to be disruptive. However, 
at any place on that campus, students should be allowed to engage in a Lincoln-Douglas style debate or even give a speech on whatever subject they wish or provide an information table on an issue or walk around in a bathrobe or a toga with placards on that say the end is nigh. Bill Nye, the science guy, the end of science. Now the danger of this policy with free speech zones is that it is uh, it starts at Texas Women's University and then it becomes a policy in Denton, Texas. Then it spreads elsewhere across Texas because it is a virus perhaps even into your community. <laughs> Good luck with that. I suppose when people fail to understand the meaning of fascism, they implement rules, regulations, zones that seek to control, actually curtail, our freedom of independent thought and speech. Someone, in this case the administration of Texas Women's University, begins to define free sp speech and loosely so, they determine what is acceptable. Yep, this is happening in Texas, I'm sad to report. Therefore, it certainly can happen anywhere. I have been on many college and university campuses and I know the real intent here. Suppression of opposing thought and speech of progressive socialism. After all, we don't need to off-end or trigger someone who does not want to hear about free market economics outside of a designated zone. Funny, I remember a book series, The Hunger Games, and how there was central control by the capital over the respective districts. And it was there that these subjugated, unarmed people were allowed to live in total and abject economic servitude to the capital. So tell me, what are the difference between zones and districts as it applies here? My grandkids actually, well my granddaughter for Christmas a couple years ago wanted the Hunger Games and so I got her the entire set and she buzzed through it. Of course she's what she reads like her Grammy. She's usually got three different books going at once. <laughs> well, this one I'm just really not into. So she puts it off to the side and picks up the other one. Ah, oh, no, this one sounds... I do that. I've got three going right now, too. In any case, so back to this. Yes, there is a major ideological fight happening in Texas. And if we do not hold Texas, we shall not hold the nation. Free speech is free speech, anywhere, anytime, and it is not to be arbitrarily restricted to designated zones. That, folks, is the beginning of tyranny, and that leads to totalitarianism. There you go. Blah, 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 blah. So remember, as Shrillery Clinton stated, when the progressive socialists are in control, in power, in power, then we can have civility. Really? <laughs> civility does not come out of uncivil people and uncivil behavior. It just plain does not. And yes, FUBAR is most definitely a succinct way of closing that article. Thank you, Alan West for letting me read that and although I didn't ask permission but thanks yeah <laughs> uh, da -da -da -da. <laughs> oh <laughs> Okay, you guys, I'm finally catching up on this, and yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, do I need to start taking orders on muffins? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Did I tell you I've got a minimum 
of 21 gallon bags of shredded zucchini in my freezer right now. <laughs> and one, one gallon bag will make five dozen muffins. So yeah, I got lots and lots and lots of shredded zucchini. Whee. By the way, my uncle also told me, because we were talking while I was helping him put together his uh, elliptical um, we were talking about how I'd been baking zucchini muffins and stuff, and he kind of perked up, and I went, what, you like zucchini muffins? And he said, well, I like anything zucchini. And I said, you want me to bring you some? And he, would you please? <laughs> <laughs> so, there's another one. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Now I got that posted on both places. Hi, Bobby. Hi, Denny. Over here on realliberty.org. Awesome sauce to see you, lady. I'm so glad you made it over. Oh, wow. I actually recognize some of those new names. Yay! I'm going to have to start doing some massive friending over here on realliberty.org. Yeehaw! Okay. Um, yay, Teresa. Teresa likes the fact that, yeah. Okay. Oh, my brother just raised, Brother Fudd, who occasionally comes into the chat, raises an excellent question. How is it greedy to want to keep your own money, but not greedy to want to take someone else's? Excellent question. I would like to know the answer to that. Okay. Yay! Yay! Oh, my baby sis. Aww. Aww. Okay, squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see. How? Where do I want to go next? Do I want to go with an FBI one or do I want to go with WorldTruth.TV? Mmm, where to go, where to go. How about I go to worldtruth.tv just because it should be a quick one. Oh, wow, holy crap. Time flies when you're having fun. 24 hard facts about 9-11 that cannot be debunked. Do the math. So, two planes, three buildings. Yeah, do the math. 9-11 uh, has been one of the biggest events in recent history that sparked a mass awakening across the world. There has been much debate as to how it happened, who is responsible, and why. And to this day, about one-third of Americans do not believe the official story. I think I would put that number just a little bit higher now, but... Mm. So... In other areas of the world, as much as 90% of the country does not believe the official story. Those are the ones that we dropped democracy on in the form of bombs. Just saying. So, here's a list of 24 facts that cannot be debunked about 9-11. Number one, nanothermite was found in the dust at ground zero. Period. Period. Why? Why? Yeah. Tell me why. Number two, 1,700 plus engineers and architects support a real independent 9-11 investigation. Those are people that know how these things, you know, how to build these things and how to take them apart. Number three, the total collapse of World Trade Center 7 in 6.5 seconds at free fall acceleration. NIST admits 2.5 seconds. Now, Larry Silverstein actually used the term pullet. It was a steel-framed high-rise building that have never totally collapsed from fire or structural damage, but Building 7 was not hit by a plane. Number 4. Dick Cheney was in command of NORAD on 9-11 while running war games. Ah, good old Dick. Such a prick. And the stand-down order. Of course, the order still stands. So, there has not been anything contradictory to that yet. 
Number five, six out of the ten commissioners believe the 9-11 commission report was set up to fail. Co-chairs Hamilton and Keene said it was a 30-year conspiracy and the White House has played cover-up. Number six, FBI confiscated 84 to 85 videos from the Pentagon and the Musau trial revealed the uh, revealed these videos and released Pentagon security footage in the Freedom of Information Act does not show a 757 and is clearly missing a frame. Huh. Number seven, Osama bin Laden was not wanted by the FBI for the 9-11 attacks. No hard evidence connecting bin Laden to 9-11. CIA created, trained, and funded Al-Qaeda Taliban during the Mujahideen. And OBL was a CIA asset name, Tim Osman. OBL was reported dead in December of 2001. That's Osama bin Laden, by the way. Number eight, hundreds of firefighters and witness testimony to bombs and explosions were ignored by the 9-11 Commission report. The 9-11 Commission report bars 503 first responder eyewitnesses, such as explosions in the lobby and sublevels, and firefighter explosions. Number nine, hundreds of firefighters and witness testimony to molten lava ignored by the commission report. Sounds like you're in a, fi a foundry. NIST's John Gross denies the existence of molten metal. Or Swiss cheese. And as of 21 days after the attack, the fires were still burning and molten metal was still running. Number 10, five dancing Israelis arrested in Mossad truck bombs on 9-11 that stated we were there to document the event. Mm -hmm. Number 11, on September 10th, 2001, good old Rummy reported 2.3 trillion missing from the Pentagon. Trillion with the T. Number 12, 220-plus senior military intelligence service law enforcement and government officials questioned the official story. 9-11 whistleblowers, Patriots for 9-11, Robert Bowman, Sybil Edmonds, Albert Stubblebine, Wesley Clark, Mark Dayton, Alan Sabrosky, Cynthia McKinney, Jesse Ventura, Kurt Sonfeld. And the list goes on and on and on. Number 13. Towers were built to withstand a Boeing jet. I designed it for a 707 hit to hit it. That's from Leslie Robertson, World Trade Center structural engineer. It could probably sustain multiple impacts of jet liners, like a pencil punc puncturing screen netting. That was from Frank DeMartini, who is the de de blah, 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 deceased manager of World Trade Center Construction and Project Management. And as far as a plane knocking a building over, that would not happen. That was from Charlie Thornton, who is a structural engineer. Number 14. History of American false flag attacks, USS Liberty, Gulf of Tonkin, Operation Northwoods, OKC bombing, the Murrah building, 1993 World Trade Center attacks, Patrick Clausen, Project for a New American Century, or PNAC, needed a new Pearl Harbor for rebuilding America's defenses, and 9-11 achieved those goals. Number 15, BBC correspondent Jane Stanley reported the collapse of World Trade Center 7, the Salman Brothers building, 20 minutes before it happened. CNN, Fox, MSNBC also had early reports. 
Number 16, Flight 93 debris was spread out over many miles. Cheney admits to giving the order to shoot down 93 and shot down the plane over Pennsylvania, Rumsfeld said, and nothing that you could distinguish that a plane had crashed there, according to Chris Konicki. Not a drop of blood. That was from Coroner Wallace Miller. And there was no plane, according to Mayor Ernie Stull. Number 17. Bush hesitated for 441 days before starting the 9-11 Commission. Jersey Girls, Phil Zelikow, already wrote the outline before the Commission began. And Steele shipped overseas, which was an obstruction of justice. Yeah. The JFK and Pearl Harbor Commissions were started within seven days. Yeah, they got rid of that steel as quick as they possibly could. Because they didn't want anybody getting it tested. Number 18, the 9-11 Commission was given extremely limited funds. Basically, $15 million was given to investigate 9-11. Over $60 million was spent investigating the Clintons' affair with Monica. $60, min or 60 million over a jizz stain on a blue dress. Seriously? Number 19. Bush said he watched the first plane crash into the North Tower on TV before entering the classroom. Well, yeah, the TV was obviously on, uh-huh. And was informed about the second impact while reading My Pet Goat to the children. And remained for at least eight more minutes while America was under attack. And if anybody has seen any of the videos about that, if you look really, 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 really close, that book was upside down. Number 20, the Patriot Act was written before 9-11, signed into law October 26, 2001. Number 21, Marvin Bush was director of um, Strata, Stratasec, uh, which was in charge of security for the World Trade Center, and United Airlines and Dulles International Airport. Uh -huh. All three were breached on 9-11. ICTS was another company that provided security at the airports. Uh -huh. Number 22, who killed John O'Neill? former FBI task force agent investigating Al-Qaeda and bin Laden. He was transferred by Kroll Corporation to head the security just before 9-11. John O'Neill died in the towers. Number 23, insider trading based on foreknowledge put options, never identified insiders, made millions and United and American Airlines and Raytheon. Check them out. And finally, number 24, at least seven of the 19 listed hijackers are still alive, according to the BBC. No video footage of 19 hijackers or passengers aboard the four planes. Pilots of the four planes never squawked the hijacking code. So, and yeah, World Trade Center 7 is the smoking gun. Now, Building 7 was a 47-story skyscraper and was part of the World Trade Center complex, built in 1984. It would have been the tallest high-rise in 33 states in the United States, and it collapsed at 5.20 p.m. on September 11, 2001, in 6.5 seconds at freefall acceleration. It was not hit by an airplane, and suffered minimal damage compared to other buildings much closer to the Twin Towers. If that ain't enough to make you go, something's very wrong here, then sorry, honey. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Frampy. That's right.
because I can read upside down as well. But yeah. <sighs> Hi, Chalcedony. Long time no see you chat. Okay, let me put this over here on realliberty.org as well. Okay. Let's see. Now, I think it's time I go check out the pig real quick, just to make sure that I get this date in history in under the wire. So, over here on PIGazette.com, where Porcus and Hambo hang out and dispense all of their wonderful little wisdom, wisdom droppings. What's this? I see Sam Elliott. Okay, nope. Uh, word of the day is ours. It's a pronoun. The, it's the prevailing attitude in the halls of government, wherein all of your worldly goods belong to them, unless in their boundless generosity they allow you to keep some of it. Gee, thanks. In the quotable quotes section, we must reject the idea that every time a law is broken, society is guilty rather than the lawbreaker. It is time to restore the American precept that each individual is accountable for his actions. That's from Ronnie Reagan. Thank you, Ronnie. Okay. In their tasty tidbits, here's some interesting thoughts. Eleven teens die each day because of texting while driving. Maybe it's time to raise the age of smartphone ownership to 21. Maybe. Yeah, and that's not counting all of the people that they kill when they run into someone else. Did you, you know, here's an interesting thought. If gun control laws actually worked, Chicago would be Mayberry. Mm-hmm. How about this one? The Second Amendment makes more women equal than the entire feminist movement. Oh, yeah, I would say, yeah. Or how about this? Legal gun owners have 300 million guns and probably a trillion rounds of ammo. Seriously, folks, if we were the problem, you'd know it. Um, or, you know, when JFK was killed, nobody blamed the rifle. And the NRA murder um, murders zero people and receives zero dollars in government funds. But Planned Parenthood kills 350,000 babies every year and receives 500 trill or 500 billion. No, wait, no, 500 million in tax dollars annually. And that's over and above what they make from the organs that they sell and the stem cells that they sell. Yes, it's a profitable business for them. So, um, let's see, how about this one? Keep, uh, folks keep talking about another civil war. Well, you know, one side knows how to shoot and has a trillion bullets. And the other side has crying closets, safe spaces, therapy dogs, and is confused about which bathroom to use. Yeah. So, pretty much. Now, this date in history. The 17th of October, 1931. Long before the Teflon dawn, a Teflon thug named Al Capone made monkeys of the justice, justice system officials. That is until the feds sent him up the river for 11 years on income tax evasion charges. And a tax that is not even legal definitely violates the Constitution. Was not properly ratified. This date in history, the 17th of October, 1933. A man of soaring intellect who expanded the boundaries of human knowledge, Albert Einstein, arrives in this land conceived in liberty as a refugee from Hitler's Germany. 
And finally, this day in history, the 17th of October, 1938, daredevil and bone-breaking record setter, evil jumping fool Knievel was born, makes moment memorial by trying to leap over doctor. Wow. Evils are crazy men. Crazy men. Crazy, crazy. Come on over to PIGazette.com and uh, check out there. Oh, dialogue. A two-way rhetorical street where your lane has been closed off, putting you on the receiving end of libtard, victimist, or holy roller diatribe. Ah, that's from the Pig Dictionary. Yeah, come on over to PIGazette.com. Check out some of the stuff they have here. Lots and lots of links on the sides. Lots and lots of pages of their own. They are a rambunctious duo. I gotta say that for them. Okay. RealLiberty.org has been going kadunk kadunk kadunk. So, ah, Grimmy's liking things. Hey, Grimmy. I hope all of your internet issues have been corrected. I hope, I hope, I hope. Okay, let's see over here on mines real fast. There was something that I saw earlier, and I believe, I think I shared it in the RLM chat. And uh, I also shared it here in Fakey Book. It's a little uh, libtards thing. And I think actually somebody shared it earlier. I think Cowboy did. Yeah, from Mines. It's a little thing with Linus and Lucy where Lucy says, I became an Al Gore climate reality presenter. And Linus says, oh, so you mean you joined a religious cult? You know, climate change is a religious cult. You believe in things that you can't see or prove. You attack and ridicule the evidence to the contrary. You sell carbon credits as a mean for sinners to repent. And you warn of horrible punishment for not believing. And you constantly try to convert the non-believers while your leader gets rich from your unpaid labor. Yep. That's a cult. Yes, it is. Thank you, Dixon Diaz, except for, you know, peanut characters. I appreciate that, hon. That really is very, yeah. It is a cult. Um, da -da, da -da, da -da -da. There was one other thing, but I'm not, as I scroll, I am not saying it. Oh, yeah, there it is. If it's not a human being, then why are you harvesting organs from it? That is from Dr. Ben Carson to go along with that Planned Parenthood thing. Yeah, if it's not human, how can you harvest organs? Huh? Okay. Now, do I want to go here? No, let me check this one out. Okay, how about we go to consortiumnews.com. This is another one I saw over on Twitter. How the FBI silences whistleblowers. Speaking the truth... <clears throat> Excuse me. Speaking truth to power has ruined Darren Jones, who's a former FBI contract specialist who reported evidence of serious procurement improprieties. He should be the last federal whistleblower criticized or victimized, according to John Kirikow. So, the idea of whistleblowing has been in the news a great deal. Is an anonymous author... Uh, of a recent New York Times op-ed eviscerating the president, a whistleblower, is the victim of an alleged sexual assault by Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh a whistleblower? I'm fortunate to have access to the media to talk about torture after being, after blowing the whistle on CIA's program, and I think Ed Snowden, Tom Drake, and others would say the same thing about the aftermath of our own whistleblowing. 
So the cost of doing the right thing, well, the problem is that we are the exception to the rule. Most whistleblowers either suffer in anonymity or are personally, professionally, socially, and financially ruined for speaking truth to power. Darren Jones is one of those people. He's one of the people silenced in Barack Obama's war on whistleblowers, and he continues to suffer under Trumple Stilskin. Jones was an FBI supervisory contract specialist who in 2012 reported evidence of serious procurement improprieties to his superior. Jones maintained that Computer Sciences Corporation, or CSC, had been awarded a $40 million contract improperly because a former FBI official with responsibility for granting the contract then was hired as a consultant at CSC. <coughs> Excuse me. Jones said, rightly, that this was a violation of the Procurement Integrity Act. He made seven other disclosures alleging fina financial improprieties in the FBI, and he was promptly fired for his troubles. So, remember the United States has a Whistleblower Protection Act? <laughs> yeah. So, any federal employee who brings to light evidence of waste, fraud, abuse, illegality, or threats to the public health or public safety is protected under federal statute. FBI didn't care, though. Jones was a troublemaker. He was talking about his fellow FBI agents, and he had to be silenced. He crossed the thin blue line, if you will. So, immediately upon his firing... Jones appealed. He was not reinstated. However, because he had made his revelation to his supervisor and not to one of the nine people on the FBI leadership approved list of who could hear a whistleblower complaint, Jones appeal, um, appealed again, beginning a more than four-year odyssey. Senator Chuck Grassley, who is a Republican from Iowa, is the champion of whistleblowers on Capitol Hill. Whether you like his politics or not, <coughs> excuse me, Jones contacted Grassley and asked for help. His, uh, his dismissal was clearly retaliation for his revelation and was illegal, according to the whistleblower protection law. Grassley agreed and wrote three separate letters to a to the then FBI Director James Comey and then Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates. None were answered. Grassley urged the Justice Department to reinstate Jones, saying that his dismissal was a violation of the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act of 2016, which strengthened the original Whistleblower Protection Law. He added that when Yates appeared before his Senate Judiciary Committee for her confirmation hearings earlier in the year, she promised to improve the process for adjudicating claims of retaliation, including expanding the list of persons to whom <coughs> excuse me, a protection disclosure may be made. She never did that. In fact, Yates ordered the director of the De Justice Department's Professional Misconduct Review Unit to write to Jones and tell him the Deputy Attorney General's review is complete and her decision is final. Your case is no longer pending. You should not expect to receive any future communications that you or any other organization or individuals may submit with regard to your whistleblower reprisal case. In other words, the official policy of the Justice Department was to ignore the law and to give the Senate Judiciary Committee chairman and the whistleblower himself the middle finger. Single finger salute! Now the FBI's response was equally bad, albeit predictable. The FBI's Office of General Counsel wrote to Jones, the FBI was advised that you, that it will not conduct further investigation into your allegations that the FBI removed you from employment because you reported a compliance concern and retaliated against you in violation of applicable whistleblower retaliation protection regulations. 
Now, the FBI has met its legal obligation and considers this matter closed without any basis for further review or reopening. Please be advised that the FBI will not respond to any additional correspondence or emails related to or arising from the termination of your employment. So there's another middle finger. Single finger salutes all around here. And you know, when you ask somebody to investigate themselves, what else do you expect? Now, note also that the FBI refers to whistleblower regulations. It's not a regulation. It's a law. And the FBI, too, has to respect and follow the law, even when they don't want to. And yet they don't. Because, well, they write the rules and they investigate themselves and they decided that they did no wrongdoing. So, in the victimization of whistleblowers, yeah, the bottom line here, though, is that Darren Jones did the right thing. He did the honorable thing did the ethical, legal, and moral thing. And he paid for it with his career. Like other federal whistleblowers, he's ruined financially. Friends and family members have walked away from him. He can't find a job. And I can tell you from first-hand experience that the psychological weight of the fallout from whistleblowing is sometimes too much to handle. Jones' friends and supporters are creating a GoFundMe campaign to help him through this horrible period. And we also need to keep up the heat on the FBI, the CIA, NSA, TSA, and every other governmental organization that victimizes whistleblowers, basically on the Alphabet Soup Brigade, period. We have to support Chuck Grassley and others on Capitol Hill who are trying to protect whistleblowers, or they're going through the motions, and we have to force our elected officials to do the same. After all, they work for us. That's the story that we've been told. So, our goal should be a simple one. Work hard to ensure that Darren Jones is the last federal whistleblower to be treated this way. Now, John Curacao is a former CIA counterterrorism officer and former senior investigator with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. John became the sixth whistleblower indicted by the Obama administration under the Espionage Act, a law designed to punish spies. He served 23 months in prison as a result of his attempts to oppose the Bush administration's torture program. So, do you see they're all playing together? He was trying to point out things from the Bush administration and the Obama administration indicted him. And, yeah, if you don't think they're all working together, they're just wearing different jerseys? You're crazy. You're crazy. Oh, Sock Puppet, that's such a very pretty line. Okay. Put this one over. Oops. Okay, now I think I have, do I have one more pulled up? Mm -hmm. I don't think I do. So, has anybody figured out uh, what happened with YouTube or is it just a, just a, just a? Because that was kind of, that was kind of wild having people, you know, seeing it this morning and then so and you know eh. da, da, da. okay here we go this is from wired.com I have just a little bit of time and let's check this out because it's banana banana 
wired.co.uk the banana is dying and the race is on to reinvent it before it's too late oh no <laughs> the world's most popular fruit is facing extinction and scientists are racing to use gene editing to save it to succeed they'll need to over overcome an even bigger problem opposition to gmo crops uh, yeah, well, you know, if it if it's something that can occur in nature, I really don't have a problem with it. That's called cross-pollination pro cross or a hybrid. But when you start putting, you know, like frog DNA in corn, really? And that's about, you know, what they're doing with some of this weird-ass shit. Okay, during the summer of 18, or 1989, Peter Plotz was in his laboratory just south of Miami when he received a package from Taiwan. Plotz, who had earned his doctorate in plant pathology five years earlier, was collecting banana diseases and regularly received mysterious packages containing pathogens pulled out of the soil from far-flung plantations. But gazing down his microscope, he realized that the Taiwanese pathogen was unlike any banana disease he'd encountered before. So he sent the sample for genetic testing. It was Tropical Race 4, or TR4, which is a strain of the fungus, yeah, a great big Latin phrase, <clears throat> that lives in the soil and is impervious to pesticides and kills banana plants by choking them of water and nutrients. It was a pathogen that would go to consume the next three decades of his professional life. Now, TR4 only affects a particular type of banana called the Cavendish, and there are more than 1,000 banana varieties in the world. But the Cavendish, named after a British nobleman who grew the exotic fruit in his greenhouse on the edge of Peak District, makes up almost the entire export market. Brazilian apple banana, for example, is small and tart with a firm flesh. <clears throat> excuse, me, excuse me, while the stubby Pasang Awak, which is a staple in Malaysia, is much sweeter than the Cavendish. But no banana has become as ubiquitous as the Cavendish, which accounts for 47% of all global production of the fruit. And according to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, this amounts to 50 million tons of Cavendish bananas every year. 99% of all global banana exports. That's a lot of bananas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now the UK, which imports 5 billion bananas every year, has become used to this seemingly endless supply of cheap and nutritious fruits shipped from plantations thousands of kilometers away across the Atlantic. But the high volume, low margin banana industry has been balancing on a knife's edge for decades. It looks very stable because we're getting bananas. But the environmental and social costs that allowed that to happen have been high. That's according to Dan Bieber, who is a researcher at the University of Exeter, who works on the UK government-funded project aimed at securing the future of the banana. Banana. So if one part of this tightly wound supply chain snaps... The whole export industry could come tumbling down. Ooh, fear monger, fear monger, no more banana. What would the minions do? There is lots more to this, but I am out of time. So I'm going to go ahead and share this so y'all can check it out in your own spare time. Thank you all for listening in. You've been listening to your banana got seeds, grow a banana tree. I know, Grim. It is totally bananas. So, thanks, y'all, for listening in on this wacka 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 doodle Wednesday. I have no idea if Vinny's going to be on Friday or not, but I will be back on Friday for the Freak of Friday edition of the Rocket Chair, and Grimmy and Moose Girl will be on later on on Friday for Freaker's Ball. So, yeah, all kind of stuff coming up, but oh no, ever seen it? Ugh. E gods.
<laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, <clears throat> the banana you buy at the store isn't even a real banana. Oh, oh, thank you. Um, okay. See, and that's not the definition that I got Art Underground for a hybrid. But, you know, hybrid is man's assistance in the changing of the structure without, you know, what, yeah, we'll get into that one of these days. In any case, thanks y'all for listening in again. Hi, I'm reading the chat and going, huh? Who? Huh? Yeah? Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, so, I guess I will see you all on Friday because, yeah, I got to work tomorrow so I probably won't be on a whole hell of a lot uh, Vinny won't be on the air for the foreseeable future okay thanks Graham thanks bunches so until Friday or maybe late tomorrow I'm not sure which please remember I truly do love you all honest and for true and I wish you all enough good night